My name is Jim Bish and I'm with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is February 27, 2019 and I'm conducting an interview with Ron Smith in Sun City West, Arizona. Um, Ron, could you please give me your full name and where you were born? Okay, my full name is Ronald Dale Smith and I was born in Paris, Illinois, over in the eastern, southeastern part of the state. Okay, and um, what war did you participate in? The Vietnam. Okay, and were you, um, did you grow up in southeastern Illinois then? Is that well, where you we, mostly stayed? I grew up more or less in east central part, yeah. Okay. Yeah, farmers, just small crop farmer. Okay. Dad was a World War II vet, so that's so, where he ended up. So you grew up on a farm? Yeah. So did I. Um, and did what town did you graduate from high school from? Uh, a little town called Tuscola, Illinois. It was uh, it's about 200 miles south of Chicago, just south of University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana area. So. Okay. So just south there. Um, when you graduated from high school from there, what year was that? 1966. Okay. And what did you do after you graduated from high school? Well, I went to Wabash Community College down in Mount Carmel, Illinois for one semester and got, uh, got a notice from Uncle Sam that it was my turn to go in the, in the Army, so that didn't last long, so I came back to, to home to get ready to go serve my time, because it was just, everybody was getting drafted, and yeah. a lot of people at that time, of course, were leaving, going to Canada, and yeah. my dad was a vet, so I wasn't going anywhere but to the Army. <laughs> um, you, you graduated from high school in 1966. Mm -hmm. That's right when we, 65 is when we had the big push starting to go into Vietnam. Yeah. Um, so you were drafted then in 1967, the year, year after you got yeah. out. Mm -hmm. um, did they didn't accept community college deferments or were deferments going on? Well, we were, in a, we were an agriculture community and what we were going to school for was agricultural Ties at that time, and it was a junior college. They got, I think they got everybody in my class. As a matter of fact, really, there, was, there were four of us that went from my high school down there. We all got drafted. Mm -hmm. Two of them got tied up with getting in trouble with the law and thought they were going to get out and ended up having to go to the army or go to jail. So yeah, yeah. It, it was just that time of, you know, yeah. that was before they started the lottery and okay there wasn't very many ways of getting out of it really yeah yeah options were limited yeah limited. um so when what month did you go in into this were you well it was uh in? i think it was march of 67 when i got the notice uh from uncle sam and uh of course i just hung everything up and went home and my dad at that time was Never had said much about anything until that, and he said, well, you're not going to the Army, and I said, well, I think I am, so I went to Chicago anyway and took a physical pass, and of course, the, at that time, you had to go to the Selective Service Office, and of course, they knew where you're at all the time, and I got a bus ticket. I was going to Fort Leonard Wood, mm -hmm. and uh, he'd come out and said, no, he says, I've never told you what to do in your life, but you're not going to the Army, so anyway, long story short, he got me to the big town of Champaign or Man and I got in the Air Force to take the test, pass the test. Uh -huh. And they saw I had a bus ticket. They said, we got to deal with you quick. So that same day, I went home, packed a bag and caught a bus to Indianapolis and they swore me into the Air Force Reserves because they didn't have an opening. But I was, I scored 95% in uh, mechanical, which being on the farm. Mm -hmm. And they needed aircraft mechanics at the time. so. They got me in, I think I spent 96 days before they called me up. And then I went back to Indianapolis, swore out of the reserves into the actives and went to San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. So I think that was in about June or July, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's about three months after your notice of, 90, of March, you said, so yeah. about mm -hmm. June, July. So you um, you did your basic training in Texas then? Yeah, it's San Antonio. It used to be the only place they sent, and I think it still is for the mm -hmm. Air Force. It's a Lackland Air Force base. Yeah. And how long were you in basic training? Uh, at that time it was eight weeks and uh, I think I was there about 12 weeks because they, uh, of course you uh, got picked for what you were going to, what your job title was going to be, AFSC they called it, and uh, 
I was an aircraft mechanic and I had to go to uh, Chanute Air Force Base, which was only 20 miles from where I grew up. <laughs> so uh, they we'd pack up and go get the bus to go, and there wouldn't be enough people. So it was we played that for mm -hmm. quite a few days back and forth. But I ended up at Chanute Air Force Base, and uh, I spent six months, I believe it was there, and uh, aircraft jet over four engine. Uh, airframe and mechanical and uh, I was kind of putting in for places to go from there I wanted to get away from home I mean yeah. I joined the service so, uh, so, so that's pretty that's yeah. quite unusual from the people that I've dealt with miles to end up 15 miles away did you know that that's where they trained Air Force mechanics no, I didn't know no, until that's what AFSC they picked me for they they were given some people options and if we had a mechanical background the options weren't too high at the time because they needed yeah. people on B-52s and different things uh, because of the war. So I think I was selected for that, which was okay. I mean, yeah. I had no yeah. trouble with it. I, it's just I, the place was strange for you because you knew it too well. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew yeah. where I was at. Though. I went home, got my car, and drove back up there. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so it was nice in a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I, I know when I went in, I lacked two pounds of being heavy enough. I weighed 127 pounds, and I was like five foot five uh -huh. and I went through four complete issues in boot camp of clothes because I I grew just the eight weeks I was in there I know when my parents come to get me at Chanute they drove past me three times because I was I was now almost six foot tall weighed 180 pounds wow you had a big growth <laughs> spurt after oh, you I got out oh I couldn't sleep yeah every night I was just in pain from growing but I finally flagged them down and said it's me they said of course I didn't have any hair left to cut that all off. <laughs> yeah. But it had grown quite a bit. So, yeah, it was it was an experience to come back. and I was ready to leave again, yeah. so I put in everywhere I could think of. And yeah. So in basic training, or after you got out of basic training, you were um, doing aircraft uh, mechanical. What are some of the things that you stood out to you that you used or that later made, made a big difference for you as far as when you actually started your occupation? Um, of working on aircraft in the service? Well, being raised on a farm, of course, we did everything. Uh, didn't have a lot of money, you repaired all your own stuff, so I had, I was pretty much hands-on. I always fixed my cars and helped my dad fix equipment and knew all about maintenance on equipment, how to take care of things. So that part just, uh, just came really natural for mm -hmm. me. And uh, I got selected out of there to go to Indiana, of all places. Now I'm only 190 Mid miles. Midway ahead. Yeah. I, down route, down 70. Yeah, I uh, believe they closed that place now. It used to be Bunker Hill Air Force Base, and I think they changed it to Grissom. They named it after Grissom when he, uh, I think he passed away on the, the aircraft, a space yeah, shuttle. Space shuttle. Yeah. And uh, so that was my new home. And so you went from from um, Schnute Air Force Base in Illinois just up the road to up Indianapolis. Road to Indiana, yeah. And that, at that time, they only picked 2% of my class to go there because at that time, that Air Force Base was only one of two that had the B-58 Hustler, which was a supersonic aircraft, which was, in my opinion, it was, it was dated, it was too far ahead for the times. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, it was a beautiful airplane. That, it reminded me of a mosquito. It just it was beautiful, but uh, they told us, "Oh, you're not going to like this." <laughs> it was a mechanical nightmare. And anyway, they ended up uh, they finally uh, canned all those planes, got rid of them eventually. Wasn't but easy they, and basic enough to. Hmm? Wasn't easy and basic. No, enough it to was. Work uh, they they were crashing a lot. As a matter of fact, I worked my way up to what they called assistant crew chief position. Went out to see the plane one night and they didn't come back. Yeah, and that's when I found out all about boards of review and everything else. But it, it crashed in Danville, Illinois, so we'd lost quite a few of them, and so the demise of that came after about eighteen months of working on them, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, so you were you were there in Indianapolis then from like March nineteen sixty eight, somewhere in the spring of sixty eight. Yeah, I was there. I got there in sixty seven. No, it'll be sixty eight. Yeah, I got there in sixty eight. 
And I was stationed there off and on for five years. Really? Yeah, I was, I was TDY a lot. Temporary, that's my first tour in Vietnam was a TDY tour. And uh, just came out of there. And I was single, and a lot of guys weren't. So when it came time to take the TDYs to go other places, I always volunteered, especially on holidays. And I got transferred out of the bombers into uh, air refuelers, KC-135As. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that time, I think it was a uh, airman first and uh, became a crew chief. So I was in charge of the plane, flew with it most all the time. So it That's, got to be more fun for me than I got to yeah. to see a lot of things, but I always ended up back in Indiana. <laughs> so um, when you, when you tell, tell me about your, how you ended up, your orders to go to Vietnam and that whole process, did that come right out of your Air Force base there in Indianapolis? Yeah, so. well, the, the first time I went over there was uh, the orders were cut for Cameron Bay and March Air Force Base, which is California. And that was the only two on there, but it was a TDY, so we didn't know. I mean, sometimes they were 90 days, sometimes they were 120, sometimes they were longer than that tours. But you always kept a bag packed anyway, and so they just called me and said we were going. And I was, like I say, on air refuelers this time. So we flew to March Air Force Base in Riverside, California. And that was more or less our stateside base mm -hmm. for the time. So what I did then for the next six months was flew fighters, carried fighters all the way over to Nam and back. We'd take them from the States. Of course, we were refuelers, so we'd take off out of uh, California and head into Hawaii and take on fuel there, and then we'd leave. And usually the fighters we were gonna catch would just leave in the States. So in, out around Guam somewhere, we'd pick them up, refuel them, spend time in Guam, Okinawa, on into Vietnam, sometimes Yutepeo, Thailand. So I did a lot of air refueling over, over Vietnam. Hmm. Uh, F-4s, and some F-111s, I had a little bit of everything at that time, so. Uh, but I was still a crew chief at that time, and. What were some of your duties as a crew as chief? As a crew chief, you're in charge of, of all the forms on the aircraft, all the maintenance, making sure that you had all the specialists come out, repaired anything that was wrong with the plane, and made sure that whatever the description was, was fixed. I was engine run qualified, so I'd run engines for fuel transfers, or if we had a generator problem, anything like that. And so you course, were the prognosticator, yeah, more basically, or less. and you, then you determined who was needed, what specialists yeah, needed to come to the plane. Yeah, to you'd, fix you'd, it. Have a, you'd have a flight line truck that would come, and you, you'd more or less told them what was wrong or what you needed, if you needed egress, or if you needed electronics, whoever you needed to fix it, fuel cell, whatever you needed. And uh, you signed all that stuff off, you did the pre-flight, and I walked around with the pilot before the flight, I was on headsets to control, do all the controls, and then at the end of the runway, I'd jump out and plug in, and we'd check, make sure they was working, and roll everything up and get on a plane, and I flew with them the whole time, too. So mm -hmm. it was... Uh, it was a good experience. You were actually part of the flight crew, but you weren't. <laughs> yeah. When everybody else landed and got to go eat dinner, you stayed and worked on a plane. So sometimes you might put in 23, 24 hour shift. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it, that was the life it was. So being T-day, TDY, you never knew where you were going to or no, when. You were just always kind of on call. You never knew sometimes. Uh, I know in my time of, I was stationed in Fairbanks, Alaska for 18 months and I I remember getting on a plane up there, but I was a, a boom operator at that time. And he got your bag, and I tell you where you're going. We were going to uh, Tule Greenland, which I'd been to quite a few times. And about halfway there, they said, well, we're going to Hickam. And I went, well, we all had on winter gear. Happy gear. <laughs> it was like 80 degrees. We got there, had on thermals and a little bit of everything. So, I mean, it can change in a heartbeat. You never knew what was going to happen. And I was in the Strategic Air Command at that time, which since then they did away with Strategic right. Air, Air Command. And uh, that's all I was in the whole eight years was, was SAC. And yeah. I would have stayed for 30 if they would have left me in there. So you, you were in eight years total? Yeah. The time of, mm -hmm. So you were in and out of Indianapolis then, as far as yeah, for your quite mechanical a few years. skills? Yeah. 
and um, my TDY tour that was my first time in Nome. It was how long how did they have a certain length that you could be in the TDY tours or well that one lasted, how, how did that operate that one lasted five months that I was in and, and they could put you anywhere at any time you were just flying and doing this and then they yeah. could select you for doing something yeah else. wherever my plane went I went and uh, it was a, a 1956 model which those planes were some of those are still flying today I believe of course they are replacing them, a lot of them but it, it was an old airplane but it, it flew well and of course they just like at the airlines, they have on-time schedules and stuff, and if you make your on-times, you start running a list, and, and a plane I had had about 56 on-time flights without delay, so it was it was pretty reliable. reliable plane, so I think that's why it was picked to go, and a lot of places, all you had to do was pump gas on and kick the tires, and you were gone, and they just, there was nothing wrong, a light bulb burnt out or whatever, yeah, but yeah, but, uh, yeah it was, that, I think that's how I got chose for a lot of that, plus... I was like the senior crew chief yeah. in the 305th at that time. So on some of your um, what what were you officially? You were on the 305th. What was your well when I got to when I got to Indiana? It was Bunker Hill, and it was the 305th bomb wing. Okay. And as soon as they did away with the B-58s, it was still Bunker Hill at that time. I went to the 305th Air Refueling Wing, so the KC-135s took the place over. I don't know how many we had. We had a, a lot of tankers there. Pulled alert duty there. Mm -hmm. We had the underground alert. We pulled seven days on, three or four days off. We were alerted a lot for just practices, ORIs, different different types of things, DEFCONs, different things you have in the states. But I uh, never really got to see much until we went across the pond, as we used to say, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you'd fly. Sometimes I'd fly three of those a week, and he, of course you'd cross an international daylight. You don't even know what day it is or yeah. which direction you're headed sometimes. So when you said you'd fly three a week, was that from California over there and then back to California? And, back. and and now when you refueled yourself, when you needed refueled, where, where are some places that you picked well, up? Well, that's what we do. Uh, of course, we'd take on fuel in uh, California, and we'd fly to Hickam in, in Hawaii, and we'd take on fuel there. And we usually always carried like 187,000 pounds of fuel, which is a full load on those planes, because we had to offload quite a bit. We usually have four or five fighters mm -hmm. uh, tailing us, so we'd offload to them. Give us enough gas left to get into Okinawa or Guam, wherever our next port was that we were supposed to pick up with our, our uh -huh. fighters. And then we'd... So you refueled at Okinawa or Guam? That yeah. was another and, refueling spot. And we'd go into Cameron Bay, in Vietnam, drop them off there, and sometimes we'd get some calls for fighters needed help over there. We'd fly in country, refueling, but uh, yeah, not a whole lot. But, but it yeah. did happen. Yeah. yeah. What are some? I'm think I'm sure that there was heightened anxiety once you were flying into a war zone area, or what was was that any much different than flying and refueling elsewhere? Well. Uh, not really to our aspect. I mean, we were we flew pretty high altitudes, and uh, most of the most of the time that we were in country like that, it was the the fighters would come back out far enough out of the out of arms way to get fuel because mm -hmm. they didn't want to have to worry about that while they're getting fuel. Right. And we would usually just cut off at the at the well, more like plus like a DMZ line that we'd cut off to head back. And uh, of course, those guys were busy. Yeah, trying to help the troops on the ground keep from being overrun a lot of times, and uh, but as far as hey, I guess you knew where you were. And, yeah. Yeah, in a way, but when you're 18, 19 years old, nothing really bothers you. You're in, you're invincible. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be hurt. Yeah. You don't know you can be hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what's the process of refueling? What was that like? Did you ever run into any major issues while you're while you're refueling, or we could you explain a little bit about about the process and then some problems that could occur or that you saw while you were in the active refuelings. Yeah, well the last few years I was in, I switched to AFSCs and became a boom operator. So now I was part of the flight crew. And uh, really there wasn't very very many times that we had problems. You would always, you always had to have an emergency breakaway test. To, it was just a part of a practice drill. And uh, of course we didn't have them over in the in war zone, but 
you had to know in case something did happen. Mm -hmm. And I think the only thing I ever, in all the years I refueled, we, we did a SR-71 one time and they used JP-7 fuel, which was different than JP-4 for most fighters. So we had to go to fuel cell and they, they purge all the tanks and it's got to be perfectly clean and put the JP-7. Anyway, I was shooting a, an SR-71 and he got a bad dose. <laughs> he fell out of the sky, just poof, just started dropping. So we found out what it was. I mean, he caught it quick enough and we must have had a bad tank somewhere. But that's the only thing I ever yeah. saw anything like that start to happen. And he said he didn't want any more of our fuel, which I can understand. I said, I don't blame you, I wouldn't want it either. So we had to go back and, and dump it out. That was the last time we ever carried JP-7. But I think a lot of it was the age of the aircraft we were, we were flying was uh -huh. was old and they was purging those tanks and they, they finally got just a certain group of planes that they used for the JP-7 so they didn't have that problem anymore. Yeah. But SR-71, I was so thrilled to get the refuel one because you, you couldn't even hardly see them. When they'd land, they'd land either and stay on the end of the runway or they'd go into a, a hangar where you couldn't get to and they had a high classification of uh, to be able on security to get mm -hmm. in. So that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. So you, you did... Um, you were a part of the air refueling wing for most of your time then, your first yeah, year? Yeah, until, until I uh, ended up in Alaska. When I ended up in Alaska, I was in, uh, that was a reconnaissance group up there. That was part of NORAD, okay. Allison, Allison Air Force Base. It was, and that was all part of SAC at that point, right? Yeah. yeah were you was, part of SAC before? I, you know, this I was in SAC the whole time except the last three months I was in. Really? And that's so the what RD, they were, the air refueling wing, all that was under when that was sack. all strategic air command, yeah. Okay. And a lot of NORAD because everything we did up there, I, I pulled a lot of duty in uh, the Aleutian Islands, Shimmy mm -hmm. Island, and we flew missions into Russia and took pictures of all their re entry vehicles. And we pulled alert duty out there for 90 days at a time. And that, I think that Shimmy was about three quarters of a mile wide. And, mile and a quarter long. It was just mm -hmm. a terrible place. <laughs> there was nothing there. But you lived in the hangar right yeah. with the plane and and it was a big high it was they called them white tops. The tops were white like presidential planes. Mm -hmm. You had a red phone, you could pick up get anything you wanted uh, right out of off it, which was SAC headquarters. Yeah. In uh, Omaha. Yeah, it was a it, it was a lot of fun. But uh, and I enjoyed the eighteen months in Alaska. It was it was a good tour. And so that was your base in Alaska then that you ran operations out of? Mm hmm Yeah. And from there, they sent me back to uh, uh, Travis Air Force Base, Northern California, mm -hmm. right by the Bay Area, Vacaville, uh, Fairfield area. And that was Military Airlift Wing, MAC. And MAC and SAC didn't get along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. They probably still wouldn't if there was a SAC, but mm -hmm. uh, the SAC, SAC guys, we, we got ranked really, really well because I was an E5 and, and I had a number for E6, and most guys were in 12, 14 years before they got a number for E6. So when I reported there, they said you have to report to this big hangar, and they got you on second shift, and I didn't really want to go, but I went. Yeah. And uh, strategic air command. One thing you'll find about those guys, they they they're kind of like the black sheep squadron. They kind of fight everything you can think of because we worked a lot of hours. They didn't care what we looked like as long as we got our job done. I mean, we weren't terrible looking, but yeah, we may not have creases in our shirts all the time. Or yeah. a lot of us were grease monkeys, you know. I mean, that was our job. And when I got the Mac, I was in this big hangar, and they told me I had to have an open ranks inspection. I said, no, no. I haven't been in open ranks inspection since boot camp and I'm not starting now. So I got everybody's attention pretty quick. They had to find a captain finally. I outranked everybody but him. <laughs> and after I talked to him, he told me to go sit down. He didn't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> so my last three months in the military, I went to see, I worked on C5As, big baggage haulers. That's To me, that's all Mac was. They just carried baggage around. Yeah. And, uh, I couldn't see where I was doing any, anything good for the country, which I know I was at the yeah. time, but when you're, at that time when I was what in more 23, that? 24 years old, and had quite a bit of rank, so 
didn't put up with a whole lot, and yeah. which wasn't probably the right way to be, but that's the way I was, and that was the change of the command. So I went to get my reenlistment talk, and I said, if you guys will put me back in SAC, I'll sign up for another four. I would have probably stayed, but they said they couldn't guarantee it. And I said, well, if you can't guarantee it in writing, I'm getting out. So that's she, what I did after eight years. You know what an Air Force no guarantee is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, you know, I, a lot of times since then I've kicked myself because, I mean, with the rank I had, I could have made E8 or E9 very easily. And, of course, when you're that age, you don't think about yeah. going to be 65 someday. Yeah. <laughs> but it would have been... You know, if I had to do again, yeah, I would have stayed. Or even 40. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I would have been 38 years old, I think, yeah. and had 20 years and my, you know, medical, everything you, you don't even think about when you're that age. Yeah. No. But, uh, yeah, it was it was quite an experience to, to go out that way because yeah. I was sad the last three months I was in and the whole rest of the time I was just on top of the world. I really liked the Air Force, so it was, it was great for me, especially I... Uh, Grew up a lot. Yeah. You learn a lot, you know, how to take care of yourself and and be on your own. That's yeah. why when I went back home when I got out I didn't stay long. I said I can't stay here. This is yeah. everything has changed, but actually nothing changed. I changed. You changed. And, yeah. yeah. Well I'm sure things have changed. But um, yeah. you changed too. Um, any exciting stories when you were observing things going on in the Soviet Union? Um, well support of NORAD. I didn't, I didn't fly then. My job then, when I was on the Aleutian Islands, my job was, I was the uh, Euclid driver, the tow driver. I backed the plane out of the, when okay. that alarm would go off. I'd back the plane out and you know, hook it, and I'd take the uke back and proceed to launch. But uh, the RCs, they had the, they had a lot of pretty sophisticated stuff back then. The big uh, doors on the side would slide, they had big cameras came out and they could, I saw some pictures of re-entry vehicles. You could read the writing around on the side of everything. I mean, it was just amazing. I think they had, I don't know, 20 or 25 man crews and mainly logistics and yeah. different types of people. But even when the, when the plane came back, I usually would sit in the cockpit and do the refueling for them and, and tow it back into the hangar. That's, that's all I did the whole time I was there, except when I was stationed up, you know, back at Allison. And, and I flew quite a bit there. Yeah. But uh, so this was still the Vietnam War was going on all the time they they oh, were yeah. running. They'd probably been doing that for decades. Oh yeah. Over yeah. over yeah, um, the that, Soviet Union. Yeah, that was. Uh, I don't know how I got orders up to there when I came back from from Nam. All I knew was well at the time too I'd been married, and that didn't work out good, so that blew up, and I wanted out of Indiana in the worst way, <laughs> and. Matter of fact, I got out after four years. My four-year term was up in uh, 71, and I got out. And went back home, there was no jobs, nothing to be had. Didn't really want to be a farmer. So I had, you had 90 days at that time that you could go back. So you actually could have gone out at four years in 71? Yeah, yeah I, I was out for 89 days. Okay. On the 90th day, I went back to, at that time then it was Grissom, Saw the wing commander, and raised my hand, and I re-enlisted, got my rank back, and uh, kind of made a deal with him when we was there that I could get out of that place. And that's when they sent me to, he said, oh, I had a real good deal for you. And they sent me to Alaska, which everybody thought was terrible. It was really a good a good 18-month tour. And uh, Where was your base located at in Alaska? Uh, we were... 30, about 32 miles straight south of Fairbanks. Okay. There's an army, a Fort Wainwright army camp up there, right outside of Fairbanks. And uh, North Pole, Alaska was a little town right there by it. So it was, it was pretty far north. It was 60 below zero a couple times on the thermometer, and pretty cold. And a lot of times you'd be on the flight line, you could only work 30, 40 seconds at a time, they'd say, but we used to tie heaters to our belts and, Really? We pulled a lot of basic pre-flights and post-flights and different things like that on the planet. How was landing and taking off in those frigid temperatures? Would, uh, would that present any more problems than what you normally would the, have seen? The local planes, which were only RCs, were stationed there. The, the tankers, then they bring tankers in for our support. I don't know why they did it, but most of them came out of Florida. That was terrible. Uh, 
they're coming out of a warm climate and they put them up there and they just sit on the, on the flight line and leaked hydraulic fluid, fuel, everything. They had, heck of a time. Yeah. they had a hard time flying, but the ones that were stationed there regularly, I think they must have just been adapted to the climate because well, if you could keep the runway clean, they could come and go whenever they wanted to go. Uh -huh. And it was uh, it was just cold. Yeah. And you know to work on the planes on yeah. the flight line was was not fun. And at that time I was a team chief, and I had like eight or nine guys under me, and we worked the second shift. So I had a pretty good bunch of guys, and they were pretty loosely operated like I used to be. So I used to split them in half and give some of them mm -hmm. a certain night off and deal with what we could with the guys we had. And, I really enjoyed that time. Kept, kept that, morale up doing yeah, those things. Yeah, morale stayed up real good. And in the summer, of course, it was it'd get 80 degrees, and you had mosquitoes big enough to carry you away. So it was not only torture in the winter, but even in the summer, swatting off mosquitoes. And yeah. Being so hot after being so cold, you know. Yeah. And working in the ice fog and different things like that. So it it was. I've went back since I was. Since I lived here, my wife and I took a vacation up there, and it's. It's changed a lot, but it's a beautiful place. Yeah. People should get to see it if they ever get a chance. I know I'm glad I got to stay there. Never the never been there, but I plan on getting there someday. Yeah, it's it's well worth the tour to go. It's beautiful. So your two years reenlistment, pretty much all up there, and then you ended up in California just to finish out your... Yeah, well, I spent 18 months there. Uh, and I went in and out of Vietnam a few more times, mainly into Cameron Bay for reconnaissance work and some different... With Norway? Um, yeah. Hmm. And... Uh, what were you doing in reconnaissance over Vietnam at that point? Same thing they were doing? Yeah, the, well, I was doing more or less just aircraft maintenance work and, and yeah, they were getting a lot of Same ground shots, I'm sure, of what they were... I wasn't in any of the, of the briefings at that time because of the position I was in, which was fine with me. I didn't really want to be in those briefings. Yeah. And... Uh, but I got to know a lot of the guys that flew the that flew, and I had a lot of friends that I graduated with high school that were there at the same time. Which I I got to see a couple of them. You know, one guy just I can remember like it was yesterday. He just like his eyes open. He says, "Smitty, what are you doing here?" And we graduated guy, and I hadn't seen him that probably at that time. I'd been in six or seven years, and he's he said, "We're not on the farm anymore." Are we? I said, "No, we're not." And uh, I got to see him after I moved here. He became a truck driver and ended up we're making some trips here to Albertsons where my wife worked at the time. And I got to see him and then a couple of years later he passed away. He had a lot of problems I think from Vietnam. He was mm -hmm. an infantry and I think that's, uh, that's probably what shortened yeah. his life. But uh, I got to go back to my 50th class reunion and I got to mention him. I was in charge of the the military aspects for the class, and uh -huh. it was it was only a hundred kids in my class, and I think forty six of the guys ended up going to Vietnam. Yeah. So, military likes those rural, small towns. Yeah, well, Con more conservative. You, you're gonna get guys that are not gonna walk away. Midwestern. Because the yeah. way they were raised is your country calls you go. Yeah. You don't you don't ask questions, and uh, kind of mm -hmm. like when I told my dad. I didn't realize how smart a man he was <laughs> when I came home from there. And he said, I thought I'd live a long time before I heard that. So I got to make his day at least before his time was up to tell him. He was a smart man and he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. He, he saved me, I'm sure, from being in the infantry. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's where I would have been, which I would have went. It's no yeah. big deal. But yeah. When you're, when you're 18. There's a better place for you than yeah. that. When you're 18 years old, you're pretty much invincible. And I've oh, yeah. talked to a lot of the guys that were there at the same time. And like they said, I didn't realize until I got shot that I'm not invincible. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's why the military recruits them about that age, so they can yeah. hold them. Well, they that's have that. why the young guys fight the wars. You know? Yeah, uh, they'll, they'll do it. They don't They don't think anything else. Yeah, yeah it's hopefully something we never have to do again. Yeah. I didn't want to see my son have to go either, but... When he went, he, I took him to the airport and he was going. He said, what do I, what do, I do? So you just have to remember, you depend on the man on your right and your left, and the others want to kill you. So yeah. watch out for yourself and your man next to you. That's all I can say. Of course, I wasn't in the Army. I, but I'm sure being a foot soldier like he was and my dad, that was 
Yeah. It's pretty critical. Yeah. So. Um, so you got out in spring of 1973 then? 74. 74? Yeah, May. So the war, you'd pretty much scanned the entire Vietnam experience then. The war ended yeah. in this yeah. early 1973. Yeah. And yeah, everything was, was slowing up and they were doing away with Strategic Air Command. Rank was starting to stop. Uh, my neighbor next door was 30-year Air Force guy and he was a full bird colonel. He was up for his first star and they put a freeze on everything, which kicked him out of the service. Yeah. And like I said, it's kind of like the big companies. They, they're they giving you a package. I mean, even even in the military back when I was in, if you weren't a certain rank after a certain number of years, you weren't staying. Yeah. Because they figured you weren't you had promotable to, be, yeah. you to had a be higher rank. And, moving through rank at a certain yeah, schedule. Yeah, that it's, it's a lot it. like... I mean, I was a tool and die maker for 35 years. It's it's the same thing. You just got to keep proving your worth and moving yourself up and taking on different things. It's no different yeah. than anything else in life. Yeah. yeah. So um, as we wrap up, is there any any exciting days or anything that sticks out during your six-year service? Any certain stories that are eventful that you can think of that during your six years in the service in the Air Force that come up? Well, just had a lot of good, a lot of good times flying. I don't know how many hours I had, but I know I went across that pond many, many times, and uh, I think that was probably the best. I mean, there was always we was always joking, and having fun, and you got to fly the plane once in a while, even yeah. if you were an enlisted guy, and if you had to take a trip to the head, they would always make sure they knew you were in there, and they'd jack the plane all over the air to. <laughs> See if they couldn't mess you up pretty good, and we tied the we tied a full full bird colonel down to the cargo deck one day with tie down straps, and me and another guy, he was a lot of fun. But uh, he always smoked his cigar and walked under the plane when we'd take walk around prior to flight, and I'd say, is, it, is that lit? He said, what the hell good would it be if it wasn't lit? I said, well, okay, if you're a colonel, I'm not gonna say, but uh, Never bothered him a bit. He says, J.P. Ford, I'm going to blow up unless the fumes are all that's going to get me. But uh, he was a great guy. We, we had a good time. We yeah. tied him down a couple of times. and He let, let us set in boreholes in the sky. He'd say a few times, you know, make some make some erratic turns and different things. So there was a lot of, a lot of fun times in there that, yeah. that I'm sure were under the table. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it was a great experience. If I had to do it again, I would, I would definitely go in. Even if there wasn't a war, because yeah. I think it's, I just good, think it's good maturation kind of process. A, a good career builder, even when you get out, because yep. you realize you got to start on the bottom, no matter where you go, and work your way up. That's kind of last couple questions. Kind of deal with things you've already touched upon. Um, one is how um, your wartime service. Obviously, you got it for a little bit from your parents, your father, and then it sounds like you passed you know, some of that off to your own children and grandchildren. Um, how many how many people that have come after you um, have been in the United States Armed Services from your children or grandchildren? Well, my son, yeah, mm -hmm. he he was uh, in Iraqi Freedom. I think that's what they call it, Iraqi Freedom, I believe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was in the 101st Airborne with them for a three-year tour, spent a little over 12 months, I guess it was, in, in Iraq. And had some pretty bad yeah. dealings being the infantry that he was, and has PTSD really bad to this day. But he's 100% connected with the government, and they're getting him a lot of help. And you see in the Midwest, uh, he Is that lives, where you? He lives here in yeah. uh, in Phoenix. And uh, matter of fact, he just got a job finally. He's, he's had a hard time dealing with with a lot of things. And look, the VA's treated him really well. I have to I have to give the VA credit for that. They've they've done him well, and he took me down and said, "Dad, you need to you need to get connected." Yeah. So that's the process I'm in now too is being connected. And, uh, it's I can see where I mean I think we all have PTSD of some kind, no matter what. It's just like I tried to tell him when he came home. You need to talk about what happened. Mm -hmm. And he's done good about that. He's he's talked. He spent a, four months in a in a rehab facility here mm -hmm. in town, and it helped him a lot. And 
but there's still he's got a real short fuse. You got to watch some of these guys. I mean, it's oh yeah, it's sad to see your own son have it, but. I wish he would have done like I did. I tried to get him in the Air Force, but he wouldn't go. He was yeah. going to be Grandpa's yeah. grandson and be 101st Airborne. And I mean, he he served well, did a good job. But yeah, it's pretty put pretty much put his life on hold for quite a few years, and yeah. he's just now starting to blossom a little bit. So Army doesn't for, care about that when you're 18. No, he was he was 21 when he went in. He waited longer in life, and of course that was the, when you volunteered to go. And but he needed something. And, I'm the one that kind of pushed him that way. I said, yeah. you, you need to get in there. And, and there's a lot of bad things in there, just like there is on the outside. Oh, yeah. So you, oh, just, yeah. Anything so you can surround happen. your people who you're surrounded with. But, yeah. yeah. One, one last question, um, and you've already kind of hinted this, you know, about um, you, what you learned in the military impacted you. How has your wartime experience affected you later on in life as far as learning, um, the skills you learned, um, your trade? Could you just tell a little bit about if it has had an impact on your later oh, career? Oh, yeah. yeah, it had a big impact because when I came back and went back home, which we're always going back to Illinois, I got to uh, help Dad farm and did that for a while and worked part time for a, a place, an auto place, selling car parts, and got married, married my wife, uh, and uh, what was that, 77, got married. And we had a five-month-old daughter and a blizzard and everything was going on. And I told her, I said, I, she'd never been away from home. I don't think she'd been out of state of Illinois. And, of course, I'd been traveling for eight years of my life everywhere. I said, we're moving. Huh? Well, where are we going? I said, we're going to California. Oh, I'm not going to California anyway. Long story short, she was young, 21, 22, and I had a five-month-old. And we just loaded the car up and went west. Broke down in New Mexico. And... Uh, I spent a week there getting the car fixed, and she had an uncle in Phoenix, so he came and picked her, her and the, my daughter up, and they stayed here. So we stayed here for three months. I got a job. I knew I could get a job doing about anything, so saved my money, and I said, we're going to California. We ended up there, and I went to work for, uh, um, I can't try to think of the name of the place now, uh, Deutsch Electrical Connector Corporation in Oceanside. They, there was 50 people in a room for a job, and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going to get in here. Anyway, I filled all the paperwork out, and I wasn't, didn't sit five minutes, and they called me. And it was my military background that got me called in, plus things that I'd taken in high school, mm -hmm. industrial arts labs and different things. And they asked me if I could read a micrometer or different things, and I did, and I went to work that night. Matter of fact, I got out of there at three and went to work at four. So I worked for them. For one year, I signed a paper to, to take their uh, tool and die apprenticeship. And at the end of the year, they gave me a 10 cent raise. And I started looking for jobs and ended back up back in Phoenix working for ITT, the mm -hmm. Canon division. Spent 18 years there until they closed and moved everything to uh, Mexico. And after that, uh, managed a couple of places, worked for Corning Corporation out of New York in Glendale for the last 13 years mm -hmm. and retired after 35 years and the military helped me of course being raised on a farm you can you can pretty much do anything you want to do if you set your mind to it yeah I've always been that way I still to this day that's all I I got to be fixing something preparing yeah. something and the military was was good for that for me and I even think it helped my son somehow I mean he's He's starting out in the landscaping and doing some different things, but they already see they've got him trying to lead other people, and he's trying to say, I don't really want to be a leader. <laughs> I have PTSD. Yeah. But, uh, it, you know, it, it comes out. People see those things, and in the 35 years I was in Tool and Die, I could, see, I could tell right away who'd been in the military and who had yeah. just from their disposition, the way they got along with people, and the way they let a lot of things just roll off their back and didn't take it. Too deeply serious, you know. Have to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's life, and the military was a good thing. Yeah. And really, I anybody and ever comes to me about it, I say it's the best thing you can do, especially at a young age. You don't know what you want to do, in there. Yeah. It may give you a career. You never know, and yeah. you may stay. And often they give you a lot of skills plus the maturation lot, process. A lot of skills, and and a lot of guys stay 20, 30 years, and yeah, they're still a young man. They can. Go out and get another job. Yeah. And double dip them. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, thank you for the interview, yeah. and thank you for your service, Ron. Boy, you're more than welcome. I'd do it again.